Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this uh, rare opportunity uh, to meet together from different parts of the earth at one time and to consider your word. Uh, we ask your Holy Spirit to be with us and uh, guide and direct our speech and our thoughts. And we pray this in his name. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Well, for those who are here and those who will view later, today is a momentous day beginning one of the great T.F. Torrance books. Karen Magruder suggested three books that I that I begin with, and that was The uh, Trinitarian Faith, The Ground and Grammar of Theology, and The Christian Doctrine of God. So this is the third of the three. He said, these are foundational for Torrance studies. So we are beginning this third one today. And Mike, thank you for taking us off today with, with this. And we will be doing uh, the six chapters over six months. So the book we just finished was nine months. So once a month, we'll do that. Next month, I will be in Japan. And Ted is going to uh, work with Tom Noble and going through chapter two next month. So we are getting the best scholars in the world to look at this. And uh, so it's exciting to be here today. I hope you all uh, were able to download the handout that Mike made available. Um, it's it's very helpful. And if you have questions, uh, I want to remind you that I try to keep a constant watch on the chat and bring you in as, as is appropriate. So just for a beginning, Mike, when, when do you first remember reading this particular book in your studies? You spent a lot of time in Torrance, but when did this book come across your radar? I was trying to think of that myself. Uh, I normally, oh, here we go. I did. Uh, 2003. There you go. I normally write in the front of a book when I buy it. And um, I normally I normally don't read it unless I buy it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm a fan of my own library. Uh, so, yeah, it looks like 2003, which is interesting. And where were you in the world? What were you doing at that point in 2003? They must have read it. I must have read it slightly before then and then got a copy of it because um, actually my my personal copy, I've hardly marked it up um, except for um, looking at it. The last chapter, chapter six, the basic grammar of theology is um, heavily, heavily marked. The rest of it, not so much. So that must have been at the end, near, near the end of my PhD um study i think right uh so, somewhere around there yeah i and, um so with <clears throat> i didn't get into torrance's science stuff i i was never really innately interested in the theology science dialogue only because i don't have a background in science and um i didn't have a schooling that really exposed me to to much science that was um for me, very interesting. It just I was I was more humanities wide, and yeah. then halfway through the PhD, maybe it was halfway. The first third of my PhD was spent reading uh, everything Torrance wrote quickly to get a, a lay of the land, yeah. <clears throat> which you know quickly quickly is relative, right? Because I yeah. think on my count he's got about eight hundred publications. I think in, in something like that. Uh, McGrath's yeah. got about six fifty, but but that's not a complete list. Um, and then the other um, part of my reading was reading Eastern Orthodox theology because around theosis. And then after doing that, I realized I had to go back and read all the science stuff because Torrance is passionate for some reason about science. And so yeah. I had to educate myself on um, the people he was reading, uh, particularly Einstein, those two volumes. And he mentions them both in this little chapter. Einstein's... Um, uh, reflections on what he what he was doing and why he was doing it the world as i see it and uh whatever the name of that other book is and and so that's when i came back to torrance's books on science um i'd read theological science i remember reading that one i was in a law library waiting for my wife was doing a block course um and the law library was close uh, down in the university in town and so I remember reading theological science in a law library, pouring over it word by word, trying to work because that's that's 
possibly his densest book, I think, Theological Science. Um, yeah. Trying to work out what he was saying, writing my questions down, going the next day to track down answers to what what does that word mean and what is that concept and so I claim no expertise in science per se none whatsoever um only a passing interest as it relates to the sorts of themes Torrance is talking about here um and one of the questions I think I put in this reader was and it's probably more a question to people like Kerry Magruder or Travis Stevick or, or others. I, I don't know everyone in the Zoom, but um, those that do have science background and an ongoing interest, I'm I'm not aware of I'm not aware of anyone theological that's writing theologically today that's as up to date with contemporary science as Torrance was in his day. Not even the Templeton funded. And we're talking here multi-million dollar funding of theology engaged science or science engaged theology. I don't even see them doing anything like this. Um, but there must be people like the Kerrys and others, I, I yeah. guess. Well, we'll have to ask yeah. Kerry that question. But I wonder with Andrew Torrance even, I mean, he has maintained, I think, some relationship in Scotland to the science and church conversation and Ross Hastings at Regent certainly is interested in those questions to what degree they're up yeah, on but, it I don't know yeah but it but yeah yeah and and um I mean that yeah that's true but I mean Andrew's study was just asking church people what what science stuff that participated in so that that's that's yeah. quite different I yeah. don't see him doing any of this stuff yeah, yeah Ross has, has his interest but far more targeted particularly, uh, yeah, Alistair McGrath and put up, he will, uh, yep. he, he would be the, the rare exception because he is a PhD um, uh, in molecular biology, I think, wasn't that his yeah, first? he has a PhD in some, some science, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're right, you're right. And his scientific theology, that three volumes, he he does that. Um, I was, I, I, I'm in some regular contact with, with McGrath by email, um, and, and he's not really doing much of that stuff at the moment. He's moved into quite different fields and he's semi-retired now. Um, but you're right. Yeah. McGraw is one of those people. Um, yeah. I just think there's a gap there. It's not a gap I can fill myself. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no way. It's, I mean, the questions, I mean, this reading group, I'm hope, hoping will stimulate people to say, well, you know, that's either somewhat something I should look at or, I know some people who should be yeah. looking at it. So, I, I mean, I think the whole thing of moving the field forward is one of the hopes that when we go through these books, that it raises this question, who's doing it and why aren't they? And how could we uh, make a difference in having that happen? Howard says, it seems there are more scientists writing theology than vice versa. So, yeah, one of the, one of yeah. the trilogies yeah. of books I will do in a few years, I've started working on it and I have outlined a three volume, The Science of the Personal, indwelling and expanding the methodology of T.F. Torrance. So that is to say that one of the things that he's establishing, even in this first chapter, is a need for an integrated view of how one does science and to say that we shouldn't set aside part of the whole of the human experience. That is what it means to be persons. So, I mean, I think there are invitations to be there. And I should mention uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Greg Liston, he has a PhD in physics, quantum physics, and, and then did a PhD under me on in theology. So he's now um, just at the stage where he's now ready to do and wanting to do really science-engaged theology. So he might be one of our bright hopes for the future because uh, he, he can actually speak the, both languages. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. So I think there may be, you know, younger people who are coming along. Um, Jonathan Lett is at Laterna University. He wrote The Value of CD3 for Science for me in my third volume. And so, you know, he, he worked under Andrew at St. Andrews. And so to say there are people who I think that people like Andrew may not be the one, but he also might be able to get people who have those interests yeah. going. So, and Jonathan has done other things. He's a younger scholars so my hope is that people like him will keep the yeah that's true conversation going and also i don't know i mean um i don't know if anyone else is interested but um i mean sarah coakley when she was at harvard i i, I think she was it was when she was at harvard she was saying that um they had a new um president or 
is the president the leader the title of the leader of Harvard or um Probably and um <clears throat> you know, wanted to change things up didn't like didn't like theology much and so um she she was forced but then really enjoyed and appreciated spending a year in the science department um mm. and so that's what's got her involved in in some of these types of things which is coming through her well, we're, we're still waiting i think for volume two of her her systematic theology um where she takes these case studies and so yeah so she's another one who's who has begun to do some of that but um anyway there are a few yeah yeah and Terry Magruder is a force to be dealt with i mean he has planned uh, participatio yeah. editions that will deal with Torrance and the sciences that will, I think, further some conversations that are helpful. So uh, yeah. much gratitude for the role he plays as a historian of the sciences and his love of Torrance and the value of what it is that Torrance brings. So Matt also says that the language of Torrance has really helped me in discussion with faith and friends who were involved in science and the medical world and biological world really helped me bridge the gap so I could talk about the faith. So Part, part of this book is to help build that bridge, though. The question of whether theosis is, in fact, something that should be considered within the ground and grammar of theology. I mean, is there a sense in which the phrase faith-seeking understanding, that theosis at some level is the participatory dimension of faith that seeks discovery, the heuristic endeavor that Torrance is really trying to open up? Did you, do you have some sense that theosis is part of this conversation? Oh, I wasn't expecting that question. <laughs> theosis. Um, theosis is, um, yeah, I, I'm serious. I, th I think theosis is, <laughs> is part of every discussion in some ways. Yeah. Um, be because it, <clears throat> other people have used the distinction. I think it's useful. So theosis, this idea, this contested idea, um, contested today, but wasn't in the early church, that that human creatures were created in Christ to participate in the divine law. Um, and they had something like a maximal, the early church had something like a maximal view of theosis, whereby whatever is true of Christ's humanity will eventually become true of mine. Um, so whatever communication of attributes, however we want to pass that out from the divine to the human, the person of the incarnate son actually will become true of each of us. Um, so I, 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 I think I think that's true. And I think Torrance um, thought that was true as well. But the language, you know, he needed to change the language. Um, and so for him. What he does do reasonably explicitly is talk about the mind of Christ, you know, constantly throughout different works. And um, and I had a long discussion with Paul Molnar years ago. Paul was one of my PhD examiners, is how I got to know Paul Molnar originally, and then we've become good friends. Yeah. And, um, and, he, and he was pointing out, you know, mind of Christ is not just the rational thought processes of Christ. Mind is a going back to green nazians is what is not assumed is not healed so mind is, is effectively a a metaphor or maybe a euphemism for the whole person um and that i think that's quite useful and so yeah i think theosis is related to this through participation in christ the create order is opened up to us and i think that's partly what he's wanting to do in ground and grammar and particularly in this first chapter which thankfully um was it's a really easy read, uh, uh, this chapter, compared to some of the stuff Torrance writes. It, it's brief, it's clear, um, it, it, it's quite a simple read, actually, um, and I, I, I think. Um, and he's trying to open up here these familiar themes from other parts of his work that um, humanity occupies a place on the border of the physical and the spiritual. And, and there's other ways to talk about that. Um, and without us, creation can disclose its deeper reality and express it, but that's going to be through some supernatural work of uh, that bypasses us. And that's not natural, if that makes sense. So, you know, Jesus, well, if you don't praise me, these rocks will praise me. They will cry out and praise. 
well, the, the rocks weren't created to verbalize praise to God. Uh, right. We were, and it's our job to use whatever this means, to use rocks in appropriate ways that brings glory to God. Um, so to care for the creation, to, um, to, to allow creation to reveal its deeper reality that God has put there, order, etc., and and in the created world, humans have this unique role. Uh, it's incredibly unpopular today. Um, I've just come back from a conference overseas on ecological ecological theology, and yes. uh, I gave a paper arguing for this sort of stuff. It's just incredibly unpopular because the the only problem of the world is humans, and the only solution is for humans to go away. Like quite literally is what people are saying, Christian people. Like, At least some places. I have a there's a retreat center being built just south of where I live. That's a community all about eco theology, and the leader of it did his be men at Duke, studying how mm -hmm. to train pastors and a lot to think about the context and what it means to think theologically about where we live and to care for it. So, yeah, there's hope. Yeah, incredibly important. Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't know, did, this, did that answer your question or, or was that a tangent? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, no, we're, we're getting to it. I'm just wanting to, I wanting to bring the wisdom of what it is that your years of investment in theosis, which isn't intuitively for people, um, an easy connect. And to say that this book, The Ground and Grammar of Theology, it's easy to say, well, Jesus is the grounder, ground and grammar of theology. But to say that the nature of mind as you use Knowing the mind of Christ is a whole person way of engaging. And if you see a whole person way of engaging in Christ, then Jesus is the ground and grammar of theology. But the theology at some level is our participation. It is our theotic participation in who Jesus is, such that we see the world and ourselves and everything differently. Hence, it's science as a human exercise in engaging reality. Jesus and all that Jesus stands with and for. So theosis then becomes yeah. a bit of the standing at the crossroads. It's the human at the crossroads yeah. that meets and sees it all together. Yeah, and I, I, um, <clears throat> I, um, what I, and one of the things I like about Torrance, uh, T.F. Torrance, I, I didn't know him personally. I met him once, just very briefly, but you know, I, I, I'm much, much younger, and so it was, uh, I think, four years before his death. Um, so I didn't get to meet him and have robust discussions. It was just a nice, polite discussion, which was nice. But um, reading his his memoirs, um, reading his, his narrative about his life, listening to people like David talk about him and other stuff, um, yeah. Torrance also enjoyed creation. So he, he, he didn't live in his upper study, you know, yeah. on that second floor or wherever it was, um, he didn't simply live at his desk. He liked skiing. He liked hiking. He liked fishing. He liked he liked doing stuff. And if you read uh, some of those memoirs around the Middle East <laughs> when he was doing that um, that little tour after in between some studies, I mean, so he 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 didn't just say all this grandiose stuff about creation. He actually enjoyed creation as well. Yeah. And so. Um, it wasn't some detached. A lot of ecological theologians that I've met don't like nature personally. <laughs> they 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 don't like getting their hands dirty. They don't like hiking and doing any of that stuff. And you're like, it's just a theoretical exercise. Um, so one of the things that also I like about Torrance was he actually yeah. got out and enjoyed creation. Yeah. Um, you know, he lived his James, theology. James did as, as well. When James would teach in Seattle, I would take him out to the Cascades and the waterfalls and things here and he he loved it all it was quite clear and alan is the same way he loves fishing and you know being out in nature so to say the torrances as a family represent somebody who really engages the beauty and creativity of what the creator gifts us with so i'm going to direct you to uh, matt has put up a question regarding theosis and your kind of final statement do you, do you see that there yeah. So just seems me the that. last page had a potential critique, some concern about creating a dualism between grace given with theosis and an es eschatological way of thinking, creation waiting on the revealing of the sons of, the, of God in Romans 8, solve that potential dualism. Yeah. 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 No, I think, Matt, I think you're right. Um, I think you're entirely on track. And 
and it was a it was a yeah soft critique of of Torrance, I think, because again, yeah. um, I mean, we critique, we all do, we critique writers based on what they've written because that's all you can do. But they can't write everything, right? And so he probably had other ideas that he didn't write. Um, yeah. So, so I was lecturing yesterday to to my students, and and some of this type of thing came up, um, where they rightly were talking about, um, well, what about creation? What about uh, animals? What about? I mean, it, it, if it's not just about me and God, but it's also about creation, how does that work? And and yeah, I think the the Romans eight. Creation groans in eager anticipation for the redemption of sons of men. So, again, the paper I gave last week was the deification of nature. Now, that that I'm just using that phrase. Uh, Athanasius uses it, but it, it's not literal. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying trees and creation literally become God. Um, what I'm trying to say there with a bit of rhetorical effect is that in our deification, in our salvation, in our being caught up as Torrent says the crown of creation, the priest of creation, then all creation is brought with us. And so creation can't do that and bring us with it. We need to bring creation with us. So yeah, exactly. Romans 8, that type of impulse is exactly the way. Um, so it's not me without creation. It's me and then plural, us. Our job is to bring creation into the praise of God. Um, yeah. And, and, and again, right I think point. if that was put to Torrance, I don't think he'd disagree with that, right? Yeah. Yeah. The one person I know who did study with Torrance here is Ken Ross, spent time in Edinburgh. Do you have any comments, Ken, just on Torrance's attitude as he lectured on the nature of, of nature? Yeah. Um, One of the things about uh, studying in Edinburgh or in Scotland, for that matter, is you're never more than uh, 60 miles from the sea. Uh, and uh, uh, there's always a mountain nearby. And even from New College, you look out the library windows and you could see the highlands uh, on the on the northern horizon, usually covered with snow. So uh, you were not far from nature. Uh, and we walked a whole lot more. Uh, uh, a whole lot more, and the the whole notion of um, jumping in your car and driving over nature to get to some destination uh, just is abhorrent. I, I uh, every fellow student I knew, we were they were constantly inviting me to go out and 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 hike uh, in the Pentlands, hike in the in the in the Highlands. Uh, my best friends uh, had a list of, of the various, uh, um, what did they call them, mullins or mulligans? They were uh, 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 mulligans, cl yeah. Yeah, climbing to the tops of the 100 tallest mountains in Scotland. And they would do that uh, in an afternoon and come back, back down for dinner. Uh, sorry, supper. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, this engagement with with their, their their fleshliness and their nature and their spirituality was just a given. Uh, yeah. I think uh, that I had a couple of flashes of thought when 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 Tom was in Auburn, uh, he came over to the United States and he found this sharp rhetorical fracture between faith and reason caused by the fundamentalist modernist controversy, which was in. Uh, he was there in the uh, 30s, and it, it was splitting the, the Presbyterian Church in the United States right down the middle. Uh, there was uh, you could either you were a, a devout Bible believing Christian or you were a scientist, but you could not be both. Uh, and that is when he really saw it communicated in a way that he never saw it in Scotland. Uh, the, this hostility between spirituality and rationality. It, it, it struck him as uh, a, a very dangerous breakdown of the, of the human condition uh, and in the name of God and in the name of Jesus, especially. Uh, the, the whole idea of the Scopes monkey trial uh, uh, shocked him. Uh, and, and so it, it drove him back, because if you remember, he had spent like 20 years trying to figure out what to do about the reconciliation between the, the Episcopal Church in England and the Presbyterian Church in Scotland, 
uh, it, it, your your note about his work all in ecumenics and his use of the Greeks mm -hmm. in order to be overcome the, the the dualisms that had injected themselves into the Reformation, creating Calvinism on one side and Anglicanism on another side, Lutheranism and and then Roman Catholicism, all of these fractures greatly uh, 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 were uh, trying to overcome them through Trinitarian theology, incarnational theology, was his laboratory for thinking about how to think through dualisms. And so when it came to a, a, this dualism between science and religion, he knew what to do. And he knew who to, where to call on. And by that time, he was already uh, uh, editing the, the Church Dogmatics Volume 3, the doctrine of creation for in its English translation with, with Bromley and all. Uh, so everybody, it was, it was just a powerhouse. I mean, when you arrived in New College, and you say, I'm coming from America, it says, oh, you're going to read with Dr. Torrance. And I say, yes, it says, have you read his uh, scientific theology? And so, uh, mm. so I headed off to the bookstore and bought a copy. Much of the stuff in here, I heard in lecture form. Uh, every once in a while, I sit there going, where have I heard that before? And I just recently went out and found my 45, 50 year old notes and pulled them out. And I can see the same language, almost word for word, that is in the preface of this book. Uh, so I'm going, ah, I was really there at the, I think, optimal time to, to, to jump on and, and just ride him into uh, a, a genuinely ecumenical, genuinely incarnational, genuinely biblical theology, which I, I, I stood, stuck with me for the rest of my career. And I, I am so grateful that I was there. Uh, it, it's, I was going to go to Cornell and study physics. Uh, and, and instead I went to New College and studied theology. Yep. Divine grace. Well, don't lose those notes. There's probably clues in there, things that are worth it's part of a history, a paper trail that I think was. Oh, yeah, yeah I think, you remember that uh, 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 David Torrance and and others had used the uh, lecture handouts. He he would put his first drafts of many of his chapters out as handouts, yeah. in uh, and I've got about a dozen of those, huh. uh, and and so, and just glancing at them and going, oh oh, that ended up as a chapter in. Uh, transformation and convergence, uh, uh, or, uh, or a chapter in um, the, the the earlier volumes, which were largely essays published in other scientific journals and then gathered as as. Uh, as, well, we, as we may have to go through those handouts next year or something. Just do one a month of the handouts and see the early early phases of the development of thought. So yeah, and, and there's you. a. There's a there's an unrecognized martyr in here, the poor secretary in the office who had to sit there with his manuscript typing that stuff up on mimeograph stencils uh, to run that stuff through. Let uh, for, let us take a moment sometime to thank that woman for her work. It was it was bearish. The servant heart, yes. Hmm. Well, looking, looking at the handout then, the introductory comments um, echo what it is that Ken's just been saying, and that was that these were originally um, based on lectures that were that were given, which you can, I posted earlier in the week, the fuller version of these. And if you listen, there's a lot of similarity, but there is a lot of additional type things. And again, that's, I love the commentary that happens around the regular statement that comes in, uh, whether it's in question and answer or just something he throws in as an aside. Um, so anyway, just to recognize that, yes, this is part of a very rich conversation. And um, I don't know of anybody who would have been in all of these lectures to be able to even say, well, you know, this this one, the audience was more receptive. And so he was able to deliver it in a different way. Um, it would just be interesting to hear about those kind of things. But um, to recognize that, uh, this is a multi-time poured over. There's a there's a form of developing wine in um, Italy. It's called Repasso, where you pass the wine back over the skins, and it makes it sweeter every time you pass over. It's sweeter, and I just I think that uh, maybe this book is you know one of the sweeter forms of something that's been passed down over a number of times um, to get where he got to it.
Can I? Can you say anything about the Templeton Foundation? Um, can I just ask a question if anyone knows? So, whenever, like, I don't understand, I'm not that familiar with the American context, right? So, um, lectures at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville. So, to me, that could be the far side of the moon, University of Virginia, Charlottesville. I mean, where's that? What's that? I mean, how on earth did he, like, was that just, did he have a friend there? Is that, I mean, or is that a major centre that I'm just utterly unaware of? Like, he, he pops up and does these lectures in the States. I'm like, how on earth did that happen? Like, did he have a, did he have a student that went back and was lecturing there? Or does anyone know out of interest? No. Or did they have a big funded centre? Or, or I, I get the Princeton, but... <laughs> it was and, founded by Thomas Jefferson. Um, oh, so that's a significant place. Oh, it is a major intellectual capital. Oh, and, it's very uh, much so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wayne, yeah, you have there. your hand up there. I see your hand. Yeah, th that's one of the strange things. Like I was telling you before, he 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 lectured at University of Calgary and University of Alberta. He had friends in the scientific community. It's like Carrie told me. He, he heard the first time I he ever heard Tom lecture was at some kind of scientific convention that he was there when he was doing his, uh, you know, his PhD work in, in his rock studies, <laughs> geology, <laughs> you know, so in Canada. There's, there's lots of stuff we don't realize. He was known amongst his colleagues because even just the fact that, you know, we, he was so brilliant that he had, was aware of the language to speak to other people in other disciplines. He, he actually had a, after he retired, I think he had a whole different career and 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 just getting back to that lecture at Fuller, because that was when John McKenna first met him. And the thing about John McKenna that people don't realize, he was taught by John Archerwald Wheeler personally back in the 50s. And, and that's why John was so much into this science stuff. And that's why he was one of his favorite students and colleagues. And, and it was at that time when John changed his whole direction. He was studying Isaiah at that point. But that's when he went on to go to study John of Philoponus and 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 inquire about the unity between science and 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 theology. And you know, there's a lot of people's lives that were changed on that lecture series. Yeah, very good. Well, I think to say Torrance had a broad network of people, the series that we're going through, the the 12 science theology and science, the frontiers of knowledge, yeah. represent relationships that Tom had with people around the world and in different disciplines and in different religious traditions. And he was able to have them all bring their own unique, really, perspective. Some of them echo Tom more than others, but to say he knew them and valued them and to have that kind of a networking person is, I think, is quite profound through the nature of what it means to do theology. And in the Polanyan dimension to say, you know, the scientific community is what makes science science, not just the findings of it. It's those who will discover and share and correct. And so Tom is a living embodiment of, of that, I think. So it just, did you want to say something there, Ken? Page seven of the preface in, in my print copy of the book, uh, yep. he says, I am especially indebted to Professor David B. Harned, head of the Department of Religious Studies, who has ever since he studied with me many years ago in Edinburgh, been a very good friend and whose signal achievements in administration teaching and beautiful theological writing I have admired from afar. To so, Mike, to your question of did he, yeah. did he have a friend there? Answer: Yes, he did. Uh, yeah, and yeah. somebody who was very able to persuade the Department of Religious Studies and the Department of Science uh, and Physics to invite him and yeah. and sponsor his stay while he put yeah. stuff into shape. Yeah, uh, true. Good. Thank you for finding that. Yeah, yeah, Mondo, yeah. I saw your hand up there. Did you want to say something or ask a question? Yeah, I wanted to say something. I think that the dualism that undergirds the worldview of the West is one of the reasons why we don't have more believers integrating theology and science, mm -hmm. because we have not been able to bridge the the oneness of it all, yeah. the absolute total integration, because human beings 
Human beings embrace a false sense of control through separation. Right. And if I can define it, I'm in control. Yeah. And I wanted to give you an example of something that I experienced in the priesthood of man on earth and how it is integrated in everyday life. I had just finished spending a lot, uh, spent a lot of money in fixing our yards all around the house and a family of moles moved in. And every day I would come out and there would be holes all over the place. I was very frustrated and I shared that at a dinner party. And this woman turned to me and she said, oh, I've mastered setting the traps. I'll come over and teach you. Well, she did. And the next morning, as I'm on my way out to set my first traps, the spirit says, is that how you care for my creation? And I went, uh, Lord, I don't know what else to do. What do I do? And he said, you give them a piece of land and you tell them what their territory is. It's that simple. And I said, okay. So I put my traps down. I walked out to the yard and I said, Mr. Mole and your family, the south part of the lawn is yours, the north part is ours. Is that understood? I walk out the next day and there's three holes right at the line where I had laid out. Never again did they go into that section. And I think it was weeks after that they all moved out. <laughs> the spirit moves in mysterious ways. We find that South American attitudes have the same dualistic sense. I can't remember which country you're in. Right now I'm in Argentina. I was born in Colombia. But yes, we have this dualism because it's embedded um, through Augustinian theology. Right. Okay. Thank you. So there's a foundation here of lecturing and the value of lecturing, the network of relationships, the need that we have in our current context to overcome exactly what it is that Torrance saw so long ago. And I love this section, Mike, on context, because I, I, haven't, I haven't seen somebody just as simply lay out the movement, the development of his thought in the 40s and 50s, the Reformation and Ecumenical Movement, 50s, 60s, translation and dissemination of Bart's theology, among other things, the 70s working on creation and science. That was a, a beginning step is what I'm hearing in that direction. And then Einstein comes along with um, an Athanasius. And so he moves into this uh, deeper kind of direction. And that's kind of the context in which we find ourselves in this book with theological science coming out in 69. He moves into the 80s then in this whole highly engaged science and theology, which the, the series of 12 books we're going to were 1984. Five to ninety, so that's he's really extending the conversation with these other people, where he's editing and bringing them into the conversation. Um, did you want to say anything else just about this paragraph? It's 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 there's a lot there, and it's quite rich. Oh, just just that obviously those those divisions are reasonably arbitrary in general. Um, he was, I, I just thought it'd be interesting just to have a quick look. Yeah. Well, you know, what he was doing around that and um yeah so don't, don't take those those dates um too too strictly but they are there does seem to be these clumps of work that he's bringing out and clearly the publications are coming you know some years after the 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 work and stuff um but yeah i thought that was interesting moving how his thoughts moving and progressing how early associations with people clearly sent him to his library and he's reading and reflecting and then you see that pop out as a book here or five books here and, and then a lecture series there and uh, and i was interested when he got into the um you know those academy of religion and sciences um 
yeah, I, I, so I just thought, oh, yeah, that'd be interesting. And and it did, did seem there were these clumps of work that he was yeah. doing. Yeah. 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 Um, just I thought the, um, the, the story that I found um, about his being awarded with this um, honorary doctorate of science, I, I really like that story. Um, yes, I'll go to that in a second. But, but before I do it, just the idea that you gave a picture of faith seeking understanding and the nature of the scientific tools that he got helped him in faith seeking understanding to the point that you could potentially say faith if it is a reflection on the reality of the world and coming to trust trust it so that you have an understanding faith and science merge and almost are indistinguishable distinguishable and any idea of faith that isn't grounded in reality isn't the kind of faith he's talking about and any kind of science that isn't a faithful science to the world that he's discovering isn't true science and so you have just a beautiful picture, I think, of the unpacking of his embodying faith-seeking understanding there. And and I think it's also, you know, we're all, uh, for all of us, part of our part of our research careers is is um, oh, I want to say luck. I don't. Uh, <laughs> it's like, so I met someone. They they shared something that was interesting, and that sent me off on a direction. I read this book. I happened to go into a, you know, the bookshop, and and this this particular book was on sale, so I brought it. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. there's there's uh, I'm using luck in a very general sense. So, I mean, the people, Torrance. I'm trying to recall um, his relative, who was a significant scientist. Um, was it an uncle? Um, um, wasn't um, Bernard Lovell or someone? Does anyone know? I mean, um, I just can't recall it, but he had a significant, he had a family member who was a significant scientist. I, I um, remember that the there's day. someone there, I can't remember who it was. So so even that, you know, clearly, you know, he probably went to a a, a lunch or some family lunch and sat next to, to this person and he was talking. And so, yeah, just those onto relational connections, yeah. right? That yeah. he would go on to talk about. Um, it's not that he sat down and in some vacuum decided, I think I'm going to explore X, Y, and Z <laughs> in some abstracted sense. And so I quite like that as well. He was very much a contextual figure and um, he doesn't write much about other areas um, yeah. because he wasn't exposed to them. And and that's where we get our little contribution because we were. Um, so yeah. I quite like that. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, say that a friend one day said, you know, if you want to teach someday, you should really go to Fuller. And I went to Fuller and there I met J.B. Torrance and took several classrooms. And I said, where should I do my doctorate? Well, go study with Alan Torrance in New Zealand. Okay. And, I mean, all of it was luck in the in the providential sense. I'm thinking at the end of yeah. The Hobbit. Oh, you silly Hobbit. You think you were really so lucky? Right, that's, <laughs> that's right. Gandalf, you know, it's like, mm, we have a little conversation on providence here. But anyway, so yeah, I think that's all all important just to recognize the nature of the development of persons and the guiding that we all don't choose as much as are chosen in the process. And uh, so moving on to the story then at the bottom of the page there, uh, just talk a little bit about what time you spent and how much you think there still is to be discovered in the archives there at Princeton. Um, I, I was in the archive for at Princeton. Yeah, so I probably sat in it for a month um and read everything in it um some stuff you know more closely than others there's not a lot there that that's there's not as much there as one might think because he, he pretty much published all of the major stuff he wanted to um yeah. but there are um there are tidbits and anecdotes there are letters correspondence um i'd like to go back and when i do i'll, I'll work through some more of the correspondence which was interesting although yeah. his handwriting is shocking i can't even i struggle to read it um his type stuff is better um so there's there's not there's not a lot there that's gonna um there's no bombshells in the archive yeah he does have <laughs> rather um <clears throat> this might cause some on the um zoom to blush but he does have a little exercise book um <laughs> where he has recorded every grade he's given every student he ever had and so that was really interesting uh, ah. so i looked up his book and um there's some 
incredibly well-known names who studied with him and um, some of them got good grades and some of them got appalling grades. It was like, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, right, so <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure some of them would want that book available. <laughs> but there wasn't yeah. a lot there. Um, I found what was most useful was the correspondence. So yes. a little bit of background around conferences, meetings, discussions, interactions with, with various people, a lot of ecumenical stuff early on. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's quite a lot of contextual narrative rather than substantial theology, if, if that makes sense. Well, I think that because even in this first chapter, the idea of auto-relational is introduced to say those personal correspondences are part of Torrance, and it gives us insight into the being that he was in the context in which he found himself. And you see Ken found there that Bernard Lovell was a cousin of TFT's wife. So, so there's a relationship. Thank you to Ken for that. Ken is an archivist. He knows he knows how to go and find the goods if they are to be found at all. So, so to say we those insights into the, a broader real human T.F. Torrance in his relational context, I think is helpful to understanding him. And it, it helps to make him not so much um, a daunting figure that's unapproachable, but a human who pursued well what he was interested in and left behind many yeah. many traces and many open doors for people, other people to follow. So, yeah. yeah. The only other thing I'd say about the archive is that there are... Um, there are there are a large number of boxes that are, are not allowed to be looked at. They're 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 on um, dated release. So Ian Torrance has said these certain boxes can't be opened until twenty thirty. These ones can't be opened until twenty forty or whatever. So there's clearly um, as in until until certain people die, um, Ian doesn't want some of this correspondence and information revealed um because it, it might be sensitive or whatever um so or it could simply be don't know what you're talking about mate there's nothing in here that's embarrassing at all do you know what i mean like could be an overreaction we don't know but yeah. um so that would be interesting when some of those further boxes are opened and we're allowed to to read them but again I, I don't think there'll be any bombshells myself i just think it'll probably be um, you know, um, some of you know will know well that sort of um, Scottish reserve and decency, um, and so it's probably a pretty innocuous letter, but nonetheless, let's wait till the person's passed before we read it. You know, so that good, that's good that's good enough. There'll be a movie. Queen Victoria's diaries are still off limits. You, uh, uh, there are whole sections of royal biography. That uh, it's not a one funeral that's going to allow it to be published. It's going to be the entire <laughs> dynasty dying off before they'll allow that stuff out. I don't think. I agree with you. Uh, I don't think he. Had, I don't think he had time to get involved in any scandal or anything. If nah, any, nah. they might have really uh, fired off a really nasty review, or uh, yeah. that eventually he had to say, you know, maybe I I overstated that. As he had a yeah. acid pen it, when he really wanted to uh, belittle and 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 uh, destroy uh, minor characters. Uh, uh, Cornelius Van Til going after Bart got him, uh, stung him badly. Uh, and Pastor Glass, who was a Northern Irish uh, Presbyterian who was viciously anti-Catholic and campaigned to keep the Irish troubles going and expel Catholicism from Northern Ireland, uh, he, he, he gave, uh, Tom gave as good as he got. He always came prepared with a nice yes. list of quotations to, to just demolish his arguments. That kind of polemical stuff eh, doesn't need yeah. to be read. Yeah. So this particular piece that you pulled out is in a sense a point at which Torrance is acknowledged by being given an honorary degree that he he knew his sciences. So, you know, what is what is there that you particularly saw in here other than the bit of humor, which you can talk about the humor too, but um it is a wonderful find. What what is it what are your what is your feedback on this? Oh no, I just thought it was funny. <laughs> that, that's all. I just thought um what a what a nice speech. To, yeah. to give it the occasion. <laughs> if only there were more academics that had a sense of humor. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> it's just, nice when really scientists it. have a sense of humor, yeah. And Einstein, mm -hmm. I don't I don't know the German well enough to know that that means a stone. But there it is. Now Einstein. we know that we have this, uh, there's a foundation stone, the cornerstone, and maybe it's Einstein and maybe it's Jesus. But anyway, mm -hmm. the stone. No. A stone that, nothing I mean, Einstein money, was... Nothing more than <laughs> Well, yeah, we can go ahead and leave that behind. Um, mm -hmm. In an essay on humanity, I'm looking at the top of your second page. They're not actually, that's, sorry, that's further down the way. Um, so 1983 on the back, it's on the second page. Um, so as with Einstein in physics for our, um, so that word is not one I use very often. Graduates contribution, that's somebody who is being given a, a uh, like a graduation. Is that what that word is? I'm obviously not in the high yeah, academy. So you're, you're a graduate until you graduate. So uh, I see. Um, yeah. So he was about to be has something conferred on him and was in fact. I never heard anybody talk about this um, honorary degree, the Doctor of Science. This is the first I had actually seen that. Well, uh, there's some debate, and again, some of you might know the answer. Um, um, Ian Torrance. Um, I only know Ian a bit from, I was at Princeton for six months um, and he was the president. So I'm not, you know, I don't know Ian overly well. I'm not, don't want to give that impression, but um, we correspond sometimes. Um, but um, no one's really quite sure what academic regalia Torrance wore. wore. Mm. Um, it wasn't his, um, it wasn't his Basel PhD or doctorate. Um mm. No one, yeah, but no one's quite sure whether he mix and matched regalia, or maybe it was this one, or you know, I don't know if anyone here knows. Yeah. But again, who cares? But it's just one of those interesting little things. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't I know whether he even used the, this qualification. Um, yeah, because it's not referred to that often. Right. Well, I mean, for the purposes of this book, and just to acknowledge, he wasn't somebody who dabbled in science. He was somebody who was a significant enough student of science that somebody honored him an honorary degree, Doctor of Science. So it is it is a statement by a community in recognition of achievement um, that we need to say, okay, that's, you know, again, the, your question, where are the people like that today? Are there people like that today? And if not, what can we do to encourage it more? And yeah. I think what we're doing right now is an encouragement in that direction, hoping that not only today's conversation, but others who uh, look at it will continue to be pressed in the in that direction. So Torrance notes you know, in the I'm original going, preface. Again, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm just going off the top of my head. I, I think his son, I think his son Thomas Torrance, same name, uh, was a professor of economics at Harriet Watt University, wasn't he? Wasn't that his... I think I think it was eventually was the same university. I think that may be true. Yeah, just it's that's just interesting that passed through. So they're trying to figure out how to. Uh, you probably have seen the emails of it's very difficult to get the mediation of Christ right now. So people are asking. It was Elmer who asked, you know, can we get this republished? It's like, well, who holds the copyright? Hmm. And Chalk this week said, I think maybe you might want to. You might want to talk to Ian, but it might be Thomas. I'll be having coffee with him soon here, and I'll see if, if he knows who holds the copyright on the mediation of Christ. Um, because it is still the, a textbook. Uh, I know the answer. The um the 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 executors, the the literary executors are Ian Thomas and um there's a third, one of the daughters, I believe. Um okay. they're, they're the they're, they're the literary executors, but they defer to Ian and let Ian make all the decisions. So that's the answer. Uh -huh. yeah. So talking to Thomas. Do... I think Thomas won't do anything other than maybe he'd say, I'll put in a good word for you. I mean Yeah, yeah. Ian Ian is the, if you like, the 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 he's Thank the you. chair of the estate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And 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 his concern, talking to him, his concern is he doesn't want he doesn't want more work bound up with copyright because eventually he wants Princeton to um, digitize and make available free the entire corpus. I see. Yeah. Okay, well, that's yeah. the but, interesting but we information. Don't know when. <laughs> but when, we, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, there's quite a bit available now in the Logos software. So I think there are 26 yeah. works in that. That. Uh, yeah. Because if so, you don't yeah. know, Princeton Theological Seminary, uh, they're on a multi-decade like decade program to digitize their entire collections and mm -hmm. and increasingly just make them available free. Um, so they're already, there's massive amounts of stuff already on Princeton Seminary website, which is brilliant. So so it's a great project they're doing. And, and they, buy, they buy the copyright to enable them to do it. Um, you know, that, that was Tor uh, Ian Torrance's concern. Yeah. Right. So Ken has said that 1983, um, Doctor of Science from Harriet Wild University. So that, um, I think, I think he had that, is, that is the one that's referred to. I think he had six in total. Um, I think, yeah, off the top yeah. of my head, um, okay. I think yes. I mentioned them maybe in my theology of transfers. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, page two forty four in McGrath. McGrath. Was on her honorary degrees one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. Eight. Eight. Uh nice. DTL, DTL, DD, DTL. Uh, I do not see anything in literature be lit. Uh, okay. He uh, um yeah, so he didn't get the part. He got the um language. he he got the earned the earned DD from Oxford, which is um not an honorary that one. So that's like a D lit, but yeah. it's uh it's actually earned on the basis of significant publications, and you submit those. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, I think, on the basis of six significant works. Um, oh, no. But that's technically a, a and rightly an, an earned um, DD. Yeah, huh. yeah. Very good. There you go. Look at that. Yeah. And that is a D lit. Yeah. What well, was it you held up? What did you, I didn't I didn't see what you held up. Oh, that was the uh, the list of earned degrees of all four of them. Oh, okay. Uh, and again, it's okay. McGrath. I mean, is, is everything you ever want to know about Tom Torrance is in that book. No, there are other things I want to know too. So oh. we'll keep we'll keep going. Like so your the uh, the comment you make next there, Mike, that the um in his preface he talked about the ground and grammar of a realist theology in the perspective of a unitary understanding of the creation. So that obviously is a title, which is trying to say, this is what the whole is. So is there anything about that? It did get shortened apparently for the book. So is there <laughs> an the insight of, like that longer one. <laughs> They like the word consonants to wrap up all of this unitary and stuff like that. So. Um, is there anything to listen to in that longer statement that we need to pay attention to in understanding this book? Uh, only I think because that's the that's the the revised preface. Um, yeah. the 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 term realist and critical realist this 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 looms larger and larger throughout his works. So that's to a bit not of be a, realist. Um, to not be realist is to be what? I mean, what is what is the oil here what is uh so um anti-realist would be in his sort of context um constructivism which okay. i don't know we, which is the the yeah the, the, which looms large in our new zealand context our educational context uh in humanities it's all constructivist you construct reality you don't you don't discover or investigate it right. um and so i i think that's probably what he was Pressing against in his own day, yeah. Maybe positivism, which is why on the surface positivism doesn't look into the fullness of something; it just reads off the surface. Is kind of not totally realist either. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. That was John McMurray's pushback against the philosophy department and what was going on there. Now, the yeah. at New College at the time, they they were still arguing between Kant and Hegel. Uh, mm. Kant was the was the realist. Hegel was the idealist. Who and who was the real philosopher? Uh, and to be a critical realist simply mean you were a neo-Kantian or something in that line. And that's the bridge over to Karl Barth was his his mm. radical uh, reformation of neo-Kantian philosophy to make it subordinate to theology again. They, they all picked up on that. And Bruce McCormack. Spent eight or nine years teaching at New College, uh, so they 
that's the older use of those terms over there. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, how it gets used these days. Yeah. So they would haggle about what you can and can't do, huh? Oh. But you can't make jokes about Hegel. That's what you can't do. Okay, moving on to the and key observations. We have seven Bruce McCormick key... heading back to it's interesting, Bruce McCormick's heading back to Scotland to uh, Aberdeen. Aberdeen. Yeah. Aberdeen. So he's going back to yeah, interesting. Eh? Oh, so much for retirement, huh? Yes, no. <laughs> so seven key observations. And we'll just kind of go through these quickly. Observation one is something about a worldview dominated by humanity being essential to creation and its crown or centerpiece. So what is Torrance wanting to get in that statement that is gonna unfold in this book? Um, again, I think one of the things that, that the wider theological scene, which is wider being more liberal, um, they, what they don't understand, particularly when you talk in Torrentian type terms is is when he when he talks about humanity and man and mankind, what he really means in the first instance is Jesus, and, and then secondarily the rest of us, and 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 that's sort of missed. So man, the priest of creation, is in the first instance Christ, um, and then us in Christ, and and that's that's just sort of missed by many. Um, yeah. And they just see any talk about humanity being essential to to creation as just a, a, a domineering, um, um, uh, abusive relationship, if you like, over creation, um, which is not what Torrance was talking about at all. Right. So to say the title of the book, The Grounded Grammar of Theology, is the person of Jesus. It is an easy move to attempt to say humanity reflecting on creation is the ground of where grammar is going to come from, and he's going to say it looks like a small step, but it's worlds apart. Mm, yep, yep, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so my 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 polemic against some of uh, what's happening in ecological theology, and I keep asking at conferences and interactions, what why do my why do many of my fellow Christians want to be so anti Christ? That mm. they just want to cut Christ out of it. I've just been to a conference. As I said, three days. Um, the name of Christ was only invoked when we pray. I mean, uh, how can you do three days of of ecological theology and not not appeal to Jesus robustly throughout? Um, yeah, it's it's appalling. Yeah, yeah, it's just a question of where one begins to do the uh, the unfolding of the themes. It feels. I mean, I felt this at the Bird Conference this last time. Where we're going to talk about politics, so you can either talk about Jesus, who's Lord over history and everything, and how political systems work that back with that. And Bart stood against political systems that wanted to be Jesus, right? Um, but once you once you collapse into some other starting point, then you have a thousand voices who are all contesting with one another, and it all falls apart. So this book is, in a sense, a both an engagement with theology and the sciences to say there is an appropriate ordering of our thought. And to begin with the person of Christ is to hold together both the creator and the creation. And therefore, you have a unitary um, engagement that you can unpack in reasonable kinds of ways, which leads on to divine and contingent think talking about in, the, in that book, which we'll look at at some point as well. So point two, so we're not going to do the Anthropocene, which is to make the human the center, which is basically a form of mythology. And... We're going to move then to saying that creation is created good, valuable because of God's being the one who created it, and that we can't move away from that in a sense. And I see Matt has put up, why do you think there was so little mention of Jesus at the conference? Are you seeing a lack of Trinitarian understanding of God at that level of academia? Yeah, uh, yeah. just for a bit of context, this was a, um, I know this is being recorded, so um this was a three-day biblical studies conference um, in the Pacific Islands um, on climate, health, and well-being. And so, um, uh, just trying to choose my words, really. Um, 
So it's just that the, the starting point is a radically liberal, overly contextualized um, position, whereby the Bible needs to be relativized. Parts of the Bible need to be cut out. Simply, they're just unacceptable, large parts of the Bible. So, right. and they'll just say that this, this, this is irrelevant. This doesn't. Um, uh, and so, no, there's no, there's no doctrine of the Trinity. The Trinity wasn't mentioned. God is mentioned a lot, but the, the term God means nothing to me. Um, cause there's all sorts of gods <laughs> and whenever you invoke a, a general, almost like a species category, well, I don't know what you're saying really, um, this is not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know. That, so, so Trinity and Christ uh, are not appealed to, let alone the Spirit, as in the Holy Spirit, because that would be too particular. Now we're actually talking about a particular biblical narrative where there's promise and fulfillment, where there's archaeology and teleology. Um, we're talking about historical particularity, and they don't want to do that because then, then you're locked into a text might only have a limited range of meaning, you see. And and there, what they want to make the text do is far beyond any standard communicative effort. They just want to make it say whatever they want to make it say. Um, yeah. And we all want to do that at some level. <laughs> it's just a human idolatrous impulse. But we we are chastened by the text and each other. Um, and, and that's why the tradition is so important so that none of us veer off into some incredibly weird, you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, it was just an incredibly hyper post-colonial contextual uh, context. Yeah, it really is the critique but, of both Bart and Torrance of all forms of natural theology are just taking your culture and your your views and reading them into God. It's, it's a very basic problem with a thousand forms that it takes on. When I was at Otago, they were talking about indigenous theology and the era of Moana Christ, which like an albatross would fly across the harbor there. And again, it's just taking a local icon, the albatross, and making it the Christ who flies over. Um, it is all the creation of Jesus. And they use the word Jesus. Jesus is the albatross that flies over. So you can even use the name Jesus, but mean something that's collapsed into your culture, what's beautiful to you. Um, and like that, which the phrase, you know, this yeah, is God's and, country. And, yeah, this is God's and country. none of these, none of us are denying that we're we're all it, it, to some degree contextual. None of we're not denying that. We're not denying colonialism. It, it, it resulted in awful things. Um, you know, it did result in oppression in in terms of our part of the world. Um, so we're we're not denying any of that for any that might be watching this later. That's not what right here. It's just there's not a robustly biblical, Trinitarian, Christological foundation from which to then be able to self-critique, let alone critique others. Um, and that's what the church has been arguably so good at theologically is in, in its um, the body of Christ coming together in order to discern the mind of Christ um, rather than I'll just do that in my study by myself and the rest of you are wrong. You know, yeah. that, that's always been the route to becoming an arch heretic. Um, yeah. And the, the Bible is that voice of the one Jesus who comes to all these communities and speaks to Colossae and to Corinth and to Rome and to say there is very much a meeting of people in the contexts in which the word is addressed. One God, Lord and Savior who addresses many people in different places and has different things to say, as well as Jesus just meeting people along the road and taking each one of them as they were and living out of theology. So in all of that, um, there is the sense, again, that the ground and grammar of theology is starting in the right place is important, and that's what we're doing even as priests of creation. Jesus is the one true high priest, and we live within that. Ted has a comment up there as well. Speaking of TFD's worldview, Armando's um, I'm in the moles in his yard, put to me to remembrance what TFG says on the first page of chapter one. This is God's universe, which he made accessible to our inquiries. It is precisely in this universe that we worship and enjoy him 
and seek to fulfill the divinely given purpose for intelligent human beings in its creation. So that's our living in the context um, of what a God has made and our participation. We could maybe even use our theotic participation in the beauty of creation and God's love and enjoyment of it. I reckon a, an interesting exercise would be, um, uh, not necessarily now, but we, we hold up our own copies of the book. I bet you we've highlighted all the same paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> Or the entire I thing. Have, yeah. I have notes on the <laughs> side, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I thought uh, I, I just I just loved what Armando said. I thought it was uh, it was such a great illustration of exactly the point that, that Torrance is making. Um, mm. You know, in that regard too, I I'd like to put a plug in for Paul Lewis Metzger's newest book on Trinitarian ethics. And his last chapter on the ethics of space travel is, it's, it's a little far out, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> but just a great example of this. What what implication does it have? He does, I don't think, I don't recall he talks about us being priests of creation, but that's written all through that book. Uh, we will of, have him on beginning of yeah. next year to talk yeah. about that. Yeah, anyway, it's just, uh, but I didn't want to get past your comment, to Mike, yeah. about worldview. I think that's really crucial. Yeah. Is is Metzger is, is Paul, is he talking about um the potential of space travel in the new creation? Not precisely, but he's just talking about look, if we if if we if we can't get it right here on Earth, what, what do we think we're gonna do if we we just start inhabiting oh. Mars, you know, or whatever? It's uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh but yeah, it's it's really an excellent book. Yeah. yeah, good, good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. There's a few good ethics books coming out at the moment. Um yeah. Yeah, it's Ross good. Hastings has got a, a couple uh, just come out as well, and yeah, really helpful. Yeah, yeah. good. So point three, Torrance is familiar with contemporary scientific thinkers and ideas, and the question of, you know, what is contemporary, what stays in contemporary, I'm looking at spending some time with Carrie just to look at who were the contemporary people when Torrance was doing the, the series of the 12 books that he did from 85 to 90, and the question that you've raised, who are the contemporary thinkers who might be looked for, and this might be something to put out to Carrie and answer your question. Say, Carrie, if you could give us a list of a dozen people who are worth yeah. considering that we may not see, um, could you direct us to that? That might be a, a helpful kind of thing just to see where the contemporary applies to a current conversation. Particularly, yeah, last... I mean, um, it, it seems to me that lots of the science-engaged theology at the moment is is helpful, but it's it's more pressing into psychology uh, which, which again is really helpful and makes sense, uh, moral psychology stuff. Um, but I'm not. I'm not. I, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm just not reading the right stuff. But um, but I'm not seeing much theological engagement with with the quantum physics, with with all of that sort of stuff um, yeah. and its latest advances. I mean, you've still just got pop theologians talking about string theory. Um, no physicist is talking about string theory. Like that, that that's that's just big bang theory from the TV from from a decade ago. Do you know what I mean? The they've moved on. And so my physicist colleague Greg just thinks this is farcical, you know. Um that, that's not what physicists are talking about. But right. I'm like as a non -phys so what are they talking about? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's a good question. And maybe we need to hear even not the theological debate, but what are scientists talking about these days? Bill, you have a son who's doing a PhD in the sciences, is that right? Bill, you, your son is doing a PhD, right, in the sciences? Yes, you, Bill Ford, that Bill. Are you up to, oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Well, he's a political scientist. <laughs> oh, it's political science. Okay, well, that's that's a whole that's a much more confusing world of science there. Oh, he's international relations. <laughs> well, that's all. A, there's a lot of string theory going on there, so we we can. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, very good. So anyway, point three is a it's a valid point that we we do need to be a conversation. What are scientists talking about today, and are there people who we are hearing from who we should be listening to. Yeah. So why, that might be why, a... 
we, um, why don't we ask Alistair McGrath, see if he'll come on, do a Zoom and, and talk about some of that stuff because he, he will know and he, he's um, he'd be willing, I think, wouldn't he? That'd be awesome. Well, you you asked him once if he'd be willing to come on and talk about his Torrance book, and he declined. Alice, yeah, um, I'll, uh, I'll ask him again. Yeah, that would be he's, great. He's semi-retired. Um, yeah, and he's, Brighton he's, did his um, PhD done, under under Alistair, so Brighton may have a little pull as well as you. So we'll get yeah, the pull yeah. from the, the yeah, far south. Yeah. He's, okay. he's he's um he he's um I, I was communicating with him recently and um again he's he's sort of come back to torrent stuff again um it just it, he finds it perennially useful <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Well, that'd be great i think he would have the ability to give insight as to what is going on and both in the world of the sciences generally as well as the specific engagement between theology and the sciences so that would be that would be awesome so point four, Torrance continues this theme, theology is a science, the two are not opposed to each other. So when you say, for the purpose of people reading this book, that Torrance holds theology as a science, can you give a lens through which people would be able to read that? Oh, um, <laughs> might want to open that up to others as well. Um, uh, so, it, I mean, it's all bundled up with his idea about um True, true science doesn't have a single methodology by which all objects and all things are investigated. And that's a pushback as I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but that's a pushback against certain sort of Newtonian, Baconian, mechanistic sort of views where um, most of the people I talk to in church still think that sort of um, a, a very basic form of empiricism is the only true science. And that they they believe that science is when you do a test in a laboratory with a test tube and a Bunsen burner, it proves one hundred percent categorically that things are this, that, or that otherwise. And yeah. so they still don't understand any nuance that how you study things um, needs to be dictated by what it is you're studying. So I, I use with my students the example. <clears throat> um, I said the, the 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 roading, you know, the Ministry of Works, the 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 transport agency, whatever, whatever agency you call it that deals with cars on the roads, they they hire you for a summer job and they're thinking of putting some traffic lights in at an intersection. So they hand you a clipboard and a pen and they say just count every vehicle, um, count every car that goes past. We just want to know the, the volume of traffic to know if it's worth putting a traffic light in. And they made the mistake of hiring a philosophy 101 student. And so a car goes past, tick. A car goes past, tick. A car goes past, tick. A motorbike comes along the street and they have this internal philosophical discussion. A motorbike, it only has two wheels. It doesn't have four wheels. Is a motorbike, does that constitute a vehicle? And it is a vehicle. It, it's, it's, a, it's a transportation device that now 20 cars have gone past. They haven't ticked because they've been doing their philosophical thought here. And they think, yeah, no, I think it, I think a motorbike would be valid. I think the transport agency, yeah, yeah. So they tick that, and then a couple of more cars. They tick, 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 and then a a, a Can Am Spider. That's a three wheeled motorbike. A truck comes driving. They oh, three wheel. Well, now they have the whole conversation again about a three wheel thing. And then uh, yeah, they decide, okay, I should probably tick that as well. And then five minutes later, a, a little girl comes riding on a three wheeled bicycle right a trike and he's like well that doesn't have a motor it's not powered she's not on the road but she's on the foot i mean you don't want to be 101 student to do a simple empirical exercise you just want a five-year-old everything that goes past put a tick do you know what i mean <laughs> likewise you don't want to give a clipboard to a theology student and say i want you to ask 100 people if god exists well why would you do that because it won't tell you if God exists. It'll tell you some phenomenological stuff about what they think about a God who might exist. It's a, so, yeah, Torrance was concerned rightly that depending on what we're studying, the methodology has to be appropriate for it. And then he brings us, um, I think, one of his most helpful articulations. Again, he, he gets this from Polanyi, from uh, Roy Baskar, particularly developed this idea um, and, and he ultimately, uh, Torrance, got it from Einstein. 
that all reality is stratified. It is an infinite number of strata, but typically they would talk about three and they go by different names, but the level of the experiential, the level of the, uh, I'll just use Baskars, the level of the actual, actual conditions and events, but then the higher level of the causal mechanisms that are brought into the actual which create the experience. And so you go up and down all the time in science. So here's a rock and it's hard and I can use it as a paperweight or whatever. But then you start thinking, but other rocks are soft and other rocks are dark and some are, what's going on with this stuff? It pushes you into the actual world. You get into all sorts of stuff around geology and so on. And then that pushes you into the higher scientific level. Or I use the example water. Um, we experience water as cool when we drink it from the fridge. We experience it as a bath. We swim in it. But then we also experience it as ice cubes and steam when you put in the kettle which pushes us into asking that the higher level, what are the actual conditions that are creating ice and water and steam? And what in fact is water? Because at that at that higher level, it's not water at all. It, it's something else. Water is a, a liquid form, but what do you call the, the solid? What do you call the gas? You know, there's three states. And then that pushes you into the actual real level, three states of what? And we know it's not water at all. It's H2O. It's a it's a chemical compound. And then once you get the periodic table at the higher level, you can then come back down, manipulate genuinely stuff at the actual, do experimentation so that at the experiential level, you can have all sorts of stuff like a, a steam engine, for instance. So, so I think that's what Torrance was talking about. Theology operates on the same basis as all science. It's not some special pleading that's fideism. Oh, we just close our eyes, meditate, and God downloads to us an entire system of thought. Um, yeah. th that would be some weird fideism or Gnosticism. So yeah. for him, there is more information. God does in this open universe give us stuff, but it still works on this basic stratified level of, of existence. And as you move from experience to actual to real, you're doing science. Now, what does science look like when it's investigating God and emotions and experiences and visions and dreams and sanctification? It's not a clipboard with a pen, necessarily. It needs other apparatus. It needs other methodology. And Christ for him, uh, effectively, this is a bit crude, but Christ for him effectively becomes the methodological key, the, the homoousion at the second level. Um, and then perichoresis at the top is these examples he gives, which becomes, as Paul says, Christ becomes the mysterion, the, the revelation, or Catherine Tanner, her little book, Christ the Key. At, at that, in that methodology, scientific theology, Christ is the key to the whole thing. Because for Torrance, and you know, he's just drawing on scripture tradition, Torrance, uh, uh, Christ is the unique word of God to humanity. But he's also the unique and proper response of humanity back to God. So that twofold mediation, that's what allows us to get from experience to reality. We're not inventing it. We're not creating it. We're not constructing reality or truth. We're participating in Christ, who is the mediator between all of those levels of reality, because he's God and man. That would be my sort of potted summary. And then... Others so might want to jump in and short definition that would be to say science is human thought about reality, and using Polanyi's statement, it's always done by persons, and some of those persons to choose to study only in the world of objects. Torrance is saying, no, there's a whole reality that's there, and we need to make sure that whole reality shapes the knowing and thinking that we do, and that's what science is. So there's something that's fracturing. When you divide into the stuff, the things of the world, and then the whole dimension of of persons, mm -hmm. that is an inappropriate division. That's the fracturing that his dualism at some level is standing with. Mm -hmm. So the next point where he, he then is talking about the unitary versus dualist, um, we all have experience of the physical world, and we also think, and every, every Valentine's Day they say, yeah, all that love stuff on Valentine's, that's just not real it's really all just physical and so that's breaking it apart choosing one and uh, torrance would say that is not true science 
And for this particular book to say Jesus is the one who unifies our understanding of the yeah. whole world, physical, spiritual, mental, it's all brought together in him so that it is unified, which is, again, the word, a unitary. Think, but, yeah, and I think for me, um, I mean, one, one, mm -hmm. of, one, of the, one of the more significant gifts I think I get from Torrance is just the... Um, the, the just the utter Christocentrism of everything. Um, I'm an evangelical. We talk about Christ. We sing about Christ. Christ is centered all we do, sure. But then when we actually live our lives, we we try to bypass Christ all the time. Um, yeah. Whereas Torrance, just I mean, it, it's just this radical and utter Christocentrism, um, and 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 so. I've just found that one of the more significant gifts yeah. that I've learned from him. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, exactly what you're saying. Uh, it's all true, but only in Christ. So Christ has to do that scientific work for us. And then yeah. we do it in participation with Christ, not apart from him. So he doesn't go into the laboratory and, and model for us. And then we get our turn. We go in with him and then participate through with him. And, and it's it's that constant reminder to myself, to students, to, to my church when I'm preaching. Um, we, we just, we constantly need to be reminded of that because um, we're, we're like the Galatians who foolishly started in the spirit and now want to return to the law. We, we, we just constantly want to step outside of Christ yeah. and be anti-Christ as yeah. Christians. And, it, it's astounding how silly we are, including myself, that to think that you know we we have that motive to do it, and yet um, so I think yeah, Torrance's works just keep coming back through Christ, through Christ, through Christ, uh, yeah. and and the whole scientific approach is is just a pure Christocentrism, and and again I just think a lot of readers, casual readers of Torrance just don't don't get that. I, I that, yeah, they just don't, they think he I think they think he's talking about just human enterprise that we would do individually or independently. And yeah. and, and again, I think in class, you know, I've heard some of some of his lectures and some of his talks. I think he would just in that high pitched voice get excited and start yelling. No, <laughs> that's antichrist. That's antichrist, you know? Yeah. Um and I think that's that's one of his big gifts. Yeah. yeah. And I think the nature, I mean, it's it's really the point of point six, the katafusin. If you are going Christologically, you have to listen to him. You know, I am I have come for the Father. I have come for you. Um, the Father loves you and and has given me for you. Um, where where are those who accuse you? Neither do I condemn you. I mean, there is a sense in learning to listen to Jesus. And this is where I find a lot of churches, they talk about Jesus in a sense. They think they're Christ-centered, but they never actually listen to him address the people who are there. That's the work of the Spirit. And, you know, this maybe goes into your third article theology that Jesus, in the Spirit, comes to us so that we can know and hear the word that speaks and brings us to know his Father. The Spirit moves when we cry out, Abba, Father, because Jesus has brought the sense that we are those who are made by, who are to know. And so the ground and grammar of theology, um, as the beginning of Bonhoeffer's book, Christ the Center says, all good theology begins in silence. But it's not an empty silence. It's a listening silence. Right? And yeah. so, you know, everything you're, you're saying there, amen. But we need to recognize there's a person there who's t addressing us. And he cares about us. And he speaks to us um, in ways that are true to the nature of who we are. We are sinners who are lost, who don't know we're here until we pay attention to the one who addresses us and by the spirit, hear what it is that he says as persons in his communities as well. You've already addressed there the stratification of knowledge and just the, it's a very complex thing. The day Karen Magruder said, you know, if you look at a hillside and say, you know, what's that? Well, it's a bunch of rocks and dirt. And he says, if you're with a geologist, They'll say, well, that's a hillside. You can see this strata is from that era. And the rocks that are in it, those come from that area. And there was a flood here. And they can tell you the whole story. And so Prince's work in the Grounder Grammar Theology gives you the whole story of the creator and what he has done. And it brings you into a knowing 
both of who God is, but as well as who we are within that story as well. So you then move to the priest of creation and you you take from your own work in here, Theosis and the Theology of Jan Torrens, which is to say at some level, the point of this first chapter, you see a correspondence here that you were drawn to your own work. Let's say what he's doing in chapter one, what we should take away from chapter one is something that you found rich in your own doctoral studies. Can you just speak to that? Uh, around the priest of creation. Yeah, around the theme, the priest of creation, because that's that's what this is setting us up for uh, six chapters, the first of six chapters yeah. that he wants us to get something about the human part and the Jesus part in the priest of creation part. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I wonder if, I mean, I, I just took out from a new little work, a, a, a section here, um, I, I I wonder if Marty if if anyone's read that little uh, on the handout um, and yeah I wonder if it would be more useful rather than me just sort of repeating that in a sense uh, I I wonder if there were unnecessary questions because yeah some Did people are more than me but yeah, I wonder if there was yeah yeah um, the only thing I'd I'd preface that with is that. Um, this idea of priests of creation is uh, radically disliked in contemporary eco theology. I've made that point. Um, they just think it's colonial and, um, and, and and abusive, and so it's a radical misunderstanding. Um, but it is picked up a lot in Eastern Orthodox thought. So Alexander Schmemann, Dmitri Staniloe, and and others really pick up on this idea. Um, and, and do a lot of really, I think, fine work similar to Torrance uh, around that. Um, and for Torrance, this is this is key because, um, again, Christ is that twofold mediation. Then us in Christ, we have a distinctive job to play as image bearers in this world, and it's priestly. And, and the idea of priestly foremost, not kingly foremost, um, so and and I think he chose that metaphor quite wisely. We're not we're not simply the kings of creation, which could manipulate and use it for simply our own benefit. Yes. We are the priests of creation, and and so that was a well chosen yeah metaphor. Um, yeah. Catherine Tanner and others, you know, carry on using using the term priest of creation as well as these Eastern Orthodox. And then a whole bunch of um, Christians in science, science, scientists who are Christians. So a whole bunch of them use this term. Um, yeah. But again, I've delivered some of this material at, at various creation conferences and people hate it. They just, they hate it. We need to work on that a little bit. Yeah. I, I want to know Ted's comment. Love the quote from TFT. Man, the scientist is nature's midwife. Did you want to say anything about that yeah. or? Oh, I, it, I just, uh, I think that says it real well. I mean, if, if you talk about being a priest of creation, if you got a screwed up view of what a priest is, he's really come away with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm there to rule, to <laughs> dominate, to, to oppress, you know. Call the midwife. To yeah. serve, yeah. So yeah, mid, I think midwife's a great metaphor. Time, it is. And the only other time Torrance uses that metaphor is that Israel is the womb of the incarnation. Yeah. Um, one, which too, is... Yeah interesting itself as well yeah it's a really uh, good good uh, that's that's uh, a wonderful way to put it and it's that's very i mean i understand why people would object to talking about humans being the priest of creation it's if you're um for the very reason their experience with priests or not to pick on roman catholic priests or orthodox priests you can say pastors too whatever uh but that that's not what we're talking about we're talking about how jesus is the high priest mm -hmm. And his relationship with all creation. So. Yeah. Good. Dwayne, I see that hand up, and then Armando, I'll come to you after we get Dwayne there. Yeah, I just um, I I sent a little note there to Mike, but the the key component that we're missing in everything is that we don't know how to define Melchizedek, this order of priests that is an eternal priesthood, and you talk about Christ being the womb of of the incarnation, because the priesthood all the Levitical priesthood was going to be replaced with a new covenant. The law was going to be replaced with a freedom 
that only can be experienced by the mediation of Christ. You know, and, and Paul uses those uh, prepositions by, for, and through. You know, and, and just listening, everybody came to my attention that by is the is, is the alpha, or the ontological capacity. He's the only one who can bring creation to its purpose. And for, well, that, that's the theological or the eschatological in our time. But it, in God's mind, it's already a theological position. We're already alive with Christ in him. He's already anyone in Christ's new creation. And that Melchizedek is the way in which we understand the whole purpose of theosis. And but getting back to priesthood, the, the, the when you read Israel's story, it wasn't the kingship that was most important. That's why God was king. And then they had that art. They were called to be priests. Priests actually are are uh, a higher order than kings. Like, But we've got it backwards. Because you have to learn how to worship first before you can rule. And once you know how to worship properly, you know that you know, you know, God's glory allows you to participate in his glory. No one will ever eclipse his glory. You've got to get the inverted turn back around, not like Satan, where you want to be the source and the measure no we're not the measure we get to share and participate in everything yeah. god prepared for us good very good thank you there's some really well, good stuff so. there. armando did you want to comment on your comment your comment said without the unique personal experience of our daily priesthood and ongoing participation with and through our trinitarian family of origin we run the risk of intellectual familiarity with jesus which eventually breeds contempt. Again, I the think question what I'm trying, I, I, Go ahead. I think what I'm trying to say is that Jesus is first and foremost an example of us before he can be an example for us. And because of our dualistic mindset, we have this egregious breach. And we pursue Jesus as an example for us because we've not embraced, first and foremost, that he's an example of us. Okay. Good. And to pick up on that a little bit, I remember J.B. Torrance talking about Jesus as our litur liturgos, which means the work of the people. He is the one who leads in our liturgy, but we follow in the liturgy. And so as priests of creation, we are those who follow with Jesus and doing what Jesus does, which is to love people, to love all of creation, to walk on water, to heal the, the sick and uh, to feed the hungry. Uh, there is a serving of all of God's creation that is there that calls from us to do the same. I, I do have the outline of a book I'm working on, Karl Barth and um, Echo Theology, beginning with a chapter on natural theology, just natural theology, we make about our read of nature, but the move of Liturgos is that we stand with Jesus looking at the nature of the world as God made it. We love it as God loves it, not merely as we want to use it, which is the work of, of the people apart from God. So to say our daily lives are the liturgical following of Jesus who goes before us, as you are saying, um, into the loving of all that God creates, people and the whole of the world. And so we, we inhabit or embody the ongoing ministry of Jesus by the Spirit, who is the Spirit of, of renewal and making all things new. And with a bit of groaning along the way. It's just interesting that, um, and this was 1980, there's, there's a almost consensus in Old Testament scholarship now that Genesis 1 and 2 is temple imagery, and Adam and Eve must be seen as priests, not, not simply archaic gardeners. Um, thank goodness for that. And so, you know, Torrance, Torrance was ahead of his time there in seeing, in seeing what the biblical scholars have now come to some consensus on um and that's only the last sort of what 10 15 years that the old testament scholarship has has brought this stuff out so it's yeah. interesting well the gardener is an interesting metaphor though to say just a gardener is different from to become so adequate if you know any master gardeners they know they know not only the plants they know the, the climate they know What's going to happen in six months if you don't do something? They have, a, in a sense, a unitary vision of what it is 
that each part of the garden is doing, how much light it needs, and, and all these things. It's maybe maybe a being a priest is a lot more like being a, a gardener than we think about. So I mean it's just an interesting study is you know, if Jesus is the master gardener and all of creation is his garden, including the humans that grow there, how do we follow Jesus in learning from the master gardener and in what he's doing? Which I had a master gardener teach me how to prune a Japanese maple. And he had stories for every element of it, of how you go through the process. And I thought, how how gospel-like is this, where we're learning to tend and to care and to give life and, and providing formation, but for the good of that which we are caring for, not just for ourselves. So, so some very interesting thoughts there. The On the third page, your discussion of light and the whole nature of light, which... Um, Torrance also talks about light and the Holy Spirit as the warmth that causes things to grow in the spring. So there is the physicality of light, the being able to see because of light, uh, but also just the life givingness of light that is there. And I think all of that begins to enter into this question of the ground and grammar of theology as life giving, that light giving is life giving. And we would hope for the church is that people would come and meet Jesus and that they would find a life that was otherwise not available or accessible and that the image of light standing on borders of darkness, I mean, it's not hard to see the darkness in a sense, um, places where hierarchy goes awry because it's power used for human ends versus living within the images of God's hierarchy in a Terencian kind of way to see the complexity of situations and to be able to enter in, which I do a lot with this in family systems and attachment therapy. There are layers upon layers that I can see what's going on in the relationships that are going on, but I'm thinking like Torrance. I need to see the complexities that arise within the strata of these of these relationships and the way they're fracturing because of um, fear and self-centeredness and all kinds of things that are, in a sense, the ecological problem uh, of what's going on, which Ray Anderson talked about the nature of the, the study of the ecology of a church. And I think that it's, it's um, he got that, I think, from Torrance, in a sense, that there is a sense in which we understand Jesus um, as one who comes and sees all that is going on, that the word ecology actually does become appropriate there. And it requires deep levels that not one person can get. We all need to bring the perspectives and start understanding together what it is that uh, that is going on there. He did a lecture at Seattle Pacific University. That was a major theme of that, which was quite good. So mm -hmm. I'm looking at the back page now. While Torrance's image of humanity acting as priests of creation is compelling, it is not without its problems. So this is is Mike. The, you know we need to make sure we're stepping back and not just swallowing it without thinking carefully about it. So we take this as something that is modeled to always ask. You know, are there things we're missing here or that could be improved? Um, by tying it so closely to natural sciences, Torrance fails to engage adequately in the wider realm and riches of what is what it, this priestly ministry may entail. And so by that, you're saying that Torrance didn't do the work of really showing all of the ways this thinking might play out in a variety of disciplines that are integrated, in a sense, to theological thinking, where people are compelled to do um, to do work that, for himself, he discovered, and he didn't hmm. give, or maybe to say there are still disciplines that he didn't see and maybe we haven't seen, though he did talk about science understood unitary thinking much better than the social sciences. They they were still stuck, as far as he could tell, more in a dualistic way of seeing the world than the hard sciences, which is quite ironic, but true. And the article I wrote on personalism kind of unpacked that a little bit. And so to say the church still has a lot of work to do in listening to Torrance, asking what does it mean to be priests and that there are some things that he didn't even see. So we need to do, um, I'm thinking of the new title of the University of Otago, right? They're changing, they're rebranding the university, right? Yeah, can't remember what the name is. It's, it's where things happen first. 
it's a, it's the Maori for where things happen first. Mm. And so to say the nature of, of recognizing Jesus as the true high priest and that the church lives within it, that we should be always asking by the spirit to be led to Jesus and to the place where we live and to see maybe for the first time something that hasn't been seen before. That that is living into the dynamic of what this book is inviting us into. It's not merely a recapping of past findings. It is actually an encouragement to live more fully within what it is that theology is doing. And that is to participate in the ongoing work of Jesus as the priest of all creation. To overcome the dualisms that still exist. And um, to be able to be those who make a difference because Jesus is the one who's who's leading the way um, throughout it all. You do end with a kind statement, as chapter four will highlight. Florence does consider other ways in which humanity fulfills this priestly duty, which if you could just give a pointer on what those may be. However, he reverses the language, or reserves the language of priest of creation almost exclusively for human scientific activity. And what do you wish that he had done? And this has occasioned much misunderstanding. And what is that misunderstanding? Yeah, I, it, it's just, I mean, again, it, I don't know if it's unfair, but I mean, you can only do what you can do as a as a writer <laughs> and an author. Um, but he did seem to overly privilege one science. Um, and and I think if you, if you were a social scientist and you met, Torrance at a dinner party, he'd probably just mock and ridicule you. <laughs> if you were a physicist, you'd probably get immediate respect. Um, yeah. So it's just that type of mentality that, again, that, that might just be completely wrong and that, again, he, he was reading in a particular area and that's where his interest was. But that's the critique that he, he like that um, Simeon Zal book on Holy Spirit and, and, and experience where he yeah. uses Torrance as a a, a bad example of someone who talks in grandiose ways about the physicality of the world and yet never actually gives any detail. Um, mm. And again, it's like, yes, that, that's a fair critique, but it, it, again, no one person can do everything. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, so I don't want to vilify him, but it would have been nice to see, like, I think the obvious go-to is, is pastoral ministry. Um, yeah. Most people reading Torrance are Christians. Most Christians, uh, uh, I hope, are part of a church, <laughs> and so we often go to 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 church and pastoral ministry as an example of how theology um, uh, is lived out. Uh, it would have been nice to see a bit more of that, um, a bit more of the application of priesthood. Uh, of creation beyond the the reified um, quantum physics sort of discussion, yeah. So yeah. A, a bit more of acceptability, but again, I don't know. Is that fair to to say Torrance had to do all that? Maybe that's our job. Do you know what I mean? Um, well, I, and so I take we that could as take that invitation. Well, that is an invitation. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. That's way. right. And there yeah. are the Andrew so Purvis and the Ray Andersons, and so we're grateful for them. Yeah. Um, that we recognize there's still work to be done, right? So we only Eric, look for I Tegan. think it's in the footnote. Um, I think in the footnote there, yeah, Eric Flett, Priests of Creation, Mediators of Order. So I think he does quite a good job in, in that essay of widening the application, uh, giving examples of how it could be applied elsewhere um, yeah. as, a, as a, a really good, appreciative reader of Torrance. Yeah, 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 I like his stuff, Eric Flett. Yeah, I've tried to get Eric on, but he's had enough just life crises through the COVID period. So, but maybe we'll try and get him again because he's got his nice, a nice book yeah. on Torrance as well. That'd be good. Uh, yeah, that'd be good. It plays yeah. out the social, cultural kind of dimensions that maybe are part of the invitation that you're looking for. Yeah. What would it look yeah. like to yeah. engage that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And and he's really pressing into hey, that, that applied practical space, um, which is really helpful. Yeah, the Purvis Anderson type. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think even it was that, that guy, Marty Folsom's face to face stuff is a little bit in that genre as well. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, actually, yeah. as Carl Bart Church Dog Max for Everyone with Insights for Pastors in the Church, isn't it also an attempt <laughs> to do that as well? <laughs> so, 
Yeah, Ken, Ken put a uh, Ray Anderson up there. That is a very appropriate thing to do. Um, yeah. Ten, um, uh, I, I, I've got a master's course, which I, I run for pastors, um, trying to just do this, take this stuff and then apply it into a range of, or get them to apply it into a range of pastoral contexts. Um, it's hard work, if I'm honest, um, getting them, first of all, to, to, to unlearn and relearn a new paradigm yep. and then to start creatively um, looking at how in their particular ministries, as varied as they are, we can start to put legs and arms on the stuff. But once they get it, um, it becomes um, revolutionary for their ministry. Yeah. 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 Which, yeah really. Well, I think that, that what you just said there is the great invitation, you know, firstly for Torrent Studies, as we continue to develop what is Torrent was providing as a a signpost to go forward, you know, building on BART, but that that work is still to be done and many are discouraged about the church and people leaving, but maybe it's because there's better work that could be done. And this is really part of the scope of what it looks like. So I do take it as an invitation that there is much that really can be done, that there's no reason to give up. We just need to uh, translate and do the, the scientific community's work of engaging the context in which we live and find yourself and where people are able to hear and interact and grow. And I know, Ted, you probably feel that's the work you're doing at Grace Communion with your students is you're, and you have them for a period to do that work. And um, so we commend the, the higher education places as well as Mike there in, at Laidlaw, New Zealand. You, you send out people all over the place from Laidlaw, which is wonderful as well. So are they getting torrents at Laidlaw? I mean, I know that some of the other departments sometimes you wonder if there's uh, if they if they get it. Do, uh, do you feel like they're hearing uh, you? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they haven't got any choice because <laughs> my my other colleague Greg. So yeah, we we we're on the same page there. Yeah, yeah. They haven't got any choice. Yeah, and the ones that um, you know, the students that uh um. The students are sort of have an idea of what God's calling them into yep. um, uh, are looking to make connections. Yep. Uh, and so, yeah, they're the, they're the ones that the, the light bulb moments come yeah. on. And, yeah, yeah, it's good. good. Um, I got a guy, I got a, a, a graduate, he's so he finished last year. He's just, just up the road from where I live, actually. Um, just got an associate pastor's role and... Um, and so this vicarious humanity of Christ is just the yeah. single biggest thing for him that he's ever experienced. And yeah. so he's just trying to structure his whole preaching and ministry around, which is wonderful, wonderful yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so have they, you ever so have people, like, yeah, people like that who'd be willing to come on and talk about it? I think it's really invigorating for people to hear people in process who are doing that so people don't have to have written but i mean he is obviously a, attempting to apply it so anyway if that comes yeah. up that'd be great you want to say something yeah, though cool. oh no no just saying it, it's um i'm talking to some of his congregation members and um they're loving it you know the partly they're just loving the enthusiasm um yeah. but also they're starting yeah they're starting to get infected by uh by this stuff it's great very really good, good. Good. Well, today we have covered chapter one, context, as well as hearing Torrance sound out that there's something about the word priesthood that we need to recover and clarify in the person of Jesus, that it gives us something that doesn't separate us from the world. It actually gives us an ability to engage the very work of what theology should do. And so thank you, Mike, for launching us into this. Uh, you bring all kinds of rich, invigorating things from the past as well as your research and just who you are as you show up. So we're grateful for all of that. Who's um who's doing chapter four, just out of interest? I'm not uh, volunteering. I'm just interested. <laughs> chapter four. Natural theology. Yes. It, it, chapter four is this. Carrie McGruder. Okay. So this is In still December. This is still probably the next natural the discussion of a natural theology, what Torrance did or didn't mean by it, is probably still the the single 
issue of the largest debate amongst the TFT fellowship. Um, right. So I won't name names, but significant, you know, scholars who have quite a different perspective. Um, this is probably the, the one area where there's the most debate around what he was doing, trying to do what he said. Um, that'd be fascinating. Yeah, when we yeah. get to that chapter. So we've got Steve Solari will take chapter two. Um, no, he's got chapter three. Sorry, it's Tom Noble in chapter two, Steve Solari chapter three, Harry McGurder chapter four, Travis will take chapter five, and Paul Molnar will have chapter six. So anyway, it's a pretty great lineup, I think. Yeah, it's great. Okay, well, we'll let you get on with your day. Many blessings on you, and thank you, everyone, for showing up for a great conversation. And um, we'll post this within a couple of days here, and you can spread spread it around to encourage others to enter into the questions that have been raised today. So many blessings on you all. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.